I'm not going to wander too much. I want to stay close to the mic. Um, as we get started here, I want to uh, begin by prepping for the invitation. And I want to mention a verse of scripture out of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. Verses 23 and 24, Jesus takes seriously unity. He takes seriously reconciliation. I believe one of the biggest hindrances to revival is not so much gross sin as it is gross disunity. And... Um, Matthew 5, verse 23 and 24, Jesus said this. I'm talking about someone on their way to worship. Could be any one of us driving down the road on Sunday morning and headed to church. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you. Not you have something against your brother, but your brother has something against you. Leave there your gift before the altar, in other words, stop what you're doing, turn around, go your way, and first be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. I'm going to be preaching out of, um, I'm going to be looking at a lot of verses, but primarily Acts chapter uh, 4, so if you want to turn there as well, we're going to be looking at verses 32 through 37, along with several other verses. Um, I first came to Union County to preach about a little over 30 years ago. And I came the 1st of July, and I was told that uh, the chairman of Deacon said, uh, Preacher, now we're talking my first Sunday there, and he said, in a month, about 80% of the churches in Union County are going to be in revival and homecoming. Well, I had been used to the fact that the church usually had homecoming around its birthday. But here in Union County, it probably had something to do with farming schedule and the crops, that the first two weeks in August was revival time. And pretty much 80% of the churches, preachers flip flop pulpits and had homecoming and revival. And, uh, but Fox is pretty close to your birthday. On July 5th, 1851, which was a Saturday, 13 men and 21 women agreed unitedly to petition their prospective body at Mount Olive Baptist Church, and I'm assuming that's the one over there going toward Peachland, um, down the back way, that way in order to start a new church. Have you all heard this before? The history of your church. <clears throat> the Mount Olive Baptist Church sat in conference on the 19th day of July, two weeks later, on a Saturday, granted their request, said, God bless you. It wasn't a division, it wasn't a split, it wasn't people got upset with each other and decided to go to some storefront and God leading them to start another work. They felt that and the Mother Church blessed them and supported them. That's the way it's supposed to be. So on the 1st of August, a Friday, according to the request of Reverend Solomon Snyder, E.L. Davis, E.C. Williams, S.P. Morton, and Deacons John Griffin and John Bridway, and S. Rushing, met at the Presbytery, was held and, and, and constituted them as a church to be called Falks Baptist Church. B.F. Benton was named the chairman, S.H. Parker, church clerk. Sunday, August 3rd, 1851, Falks Baptist Church meets for the first time as a fully constituted church. So you're pretty close to your birthday. 1851. What was going on in 1851? Well. Miller Fillmore was president, but he wouldn't get another term. 
he became president after the death of President Zachary Taylor. And um, a guy named Blondin was doing acrobatic stuff. We'll talk about him later. There was a heated issue dividing the country over slavery that in 10 years would divide the nation into a civil war. But Falk survived that. Falk has survived 171 years. 2006, 175. Now you think about it. We got an election this November and a cr critical one in two years, another critical one. Who knows what's going to happen in the next two years and some change. Will we be here in 2026? How about 200 years in 2051? Maybe Zeke will be the pastor then. He'll be grown up by then. Or maybe Levi, one of them youngsters. Maybe that guy right there with curly hair. Maybe he'll be the pastor. Who knows? But the thing is, the only thing that is going to remove this church and every other church from planet Earth is Jesus Christ when he splits the eastern sky and comes back to get it. Amen. No government, no army, no organization, no culture is going to get rid of the body of Christ. They've tried it before and it didn't work. The more they tried, the more it grew. And so I want to look at a church that grew, Jerusalem church, in Acts chapter 4. You know, Gordon MacDonald, author and pastor uh, in New England, um, prominent, his prominent book was Ordering the Private World, but he wrote another book not too long ago called Who Stole My Church? And it was a response to all of the conflict that was going on at the turn of the millennium with churches and changes. And um, questions were asked. Who stole my church? Well, I go around to churches in trouble. And they usually wait too late, sometimes too little too late, sometimes not. Sometimes they get turned around. But I remember one church um, not that long ago claimed they had two churches, asked what I was going to be doing about it, and I said, well, it's real simple. There's going to be one voice, and you're looking at it, and there's going to be one church, and anybody got a problem with that, they can leave. But there will be one church, and as long as I'm here, there will be one church, there will be one voice, and there will be one pastor. And that's it. Otherwise, be sick and die. <coughs> one of the ladies said, I just don't know what happened. Well, one, it didn't happen overnight. And two, there's not just one thing or person that you can point your finger to. And I like the way the Japanese approach problem solve, which is a typical Oriental, <coughs> Asian, Eastern mindset. See, here in America, there's a problem at work, something goes wrong, it's immediately point the finger, blame game, usually the wrong person gets the blame, they fire them and they think that's going to fix it. <clears throat> but the Oriental mindset is not who did this, but how do we fix it? And they focus on the solution, not so much the cause of the problem. Tonight, I want us to look at what happened to my church and how to fix it. And tomorrow night, we're going to pick up with that, with the solution. Tonight, we'll look at the problem. Tomorrow, we'll look at the solution. And tomorrow, we're going to talk about the value of vision. And so, this disunity spiral, or death spiral, 
the further down that you go, the faster it goes. And there's a point of no return, and you're not coming back. I'm sorry, but you're not coming back. And churches will continue dead on the vine and claiming there's no problem and continue to point the finger, but nothing gets fixed. You see, it starts with discouragement. For some reason, people just aren't happy. And then it continues on to disillusionment, which is, I didn't expect this. That's not what I was looking for. And then from disillusionment, it goes to disharmony. Now, harmony, um, we'll talk about that in a moment. And that disharmony leads into discord. You know what discord is? Discord, literally in Hebrew, the Hebrew word for discord, um, which is in uh, Proverbs chapter 6, 19, God said there's six things, uh, uh, Solomon said there's six things that the Lord ha uh, despised seven, he hates. And that seventh thing is someone who sows discord or distrust among the brethren. I don't want to be that person. And then that culminates with divisiveness, and you have disunity. What does disunity mean? You're not unified. What does that mean? You're not one. You're not one. <clears throat> now, church is not as popular as it used to be. Um, lots changed. Now, anybody go to Wendy's? Y'all know what the piggy bag is? Several years ago, in the kids' meal, they used to put a little book. And it was a little comic book looking thing, and it said, My Town. It was My Town. And you go through the pages, and it had all these colorful pictures of things that you would find in a normal town. They had the grocery store, the market, they had the mall, they had the airport, they had the train station, they had buses, they had the courthouse with a police car in front of it. Everything you find in town except one thing. There was no church in that book. Now that tells you where our culture is headed. That tells you what their perception of the church is. Not me. I don't know if it's still a law, but it used to be a law in Germany that no structure, no rooftop, could exceed the height of the church steeple. And if you go into any German town, they're pretty much set up the same. All the farmer fields are dressed right, dressed, cut perfectly, geometrically <clears throat> perfect, okay? And the farms, the barns and all that are on the outskirts of the town. And then as you go closer into the town, you see the houses and then you see the shops. And at the center of that town is the church. Still that way. Most of Europe is that way. Now whether spiritually and culturally the church is still the center of the town, who knows? But physically it's still there. Let's look at Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 32. The author tells this about the Jerusalem church. Multitude of them who believed were of one heart, one soul, neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. Verse 33 is critical. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And great grace was upon them all. Why? Because there were one heart, one soul. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of, of the things that were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet, the leadership's feet, and distributed to each one as he had need. And Joses, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, 
a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. May the Lord bless his reading of his word to our hearts. Um, I think what happened is in our attempt to avoid adopting a culture, we failed to adapt to it. We've let it define us. In other words, we have allowed the culture, we've allowed the government, we have allowed the world to define the church. Not the church define God's kingdom to them. Now we've got to turn that around. The only one responsible for doing that is the church. We're the ones who've been mandated to change the world. We are the hands and feet, the body of Christ, filled with His Holy Spirit to do His work. The same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, the same Holy Spirit that showed up on Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, the same Holy Spirit that raised people from the dead and healed the sick, is the same Holy Spirit that we have available to us. The same Holy Spirit that is living in each and every one of us who calls Jesus our Savior and our Lord. Now here's the, pro here's the problem that was foreseen 10 years ago, not by a preacher, but a Supreme Court justice. Anton and Scalia said this 10 years ago in 2012. God assumed from the beginning that the wise of the world would view Christians as fools. And he's not been disappointed. If I brought any message today, it is this. Have the courage to have your wisdom regarded as stupidity, be fools for Christ, and have the courage to suffer the contempt of the sophisticated world. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 Paul said this in verse 18 and verse 21 and verse 25. He said, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. He said, since the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who would believe. The foolishness of preaching. Preaching of the gospel. So how do people get saved? The preaching of the gospel. The proclaiming of the gospel. That's the way it's always been, and I'm going to tell you right now that if you go into a lot of churches that are not growing, that are dying, it might become pretty clear, well, maybe because they're not focusing on the foolishness of preaching, they're focusing on something else. Or maybe they can't focus on anything because they're so disunified. There's such disharmony. Verse 25 because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. <coughs> Being unified takes work. It takes practice. But we don't have any other choice. Our goal needs to be oneness, and the result will be power to witness. And to practice that, I want us to look Got some practices in promoting oneness here tonight. And the first one is this. We need to have a united membership. Unity. One mind. One spirit. One purpose. One mission. One goal. There needs to be, uni there needs to be uniformity in our beliefs and our purpose. And there needs to be harmony in our practice. I mentioned harmony before. I mentioned disharmony. What is? Let me give you an example of disharmony. You go to the opera real early. I'm sure all of us are going to go to the opera real soon. But if you watch it on TV or some big musical <coughs> concert, some symphony orchestra, you go there and you get there early, and all the musicians are tuning up their instruments. And it sounds like a bunch of noise and racket because they're all doing their own thing. That's disharmony. That's not harmony, that's disharmony. Now, when they get unified, okay, and all of these 
different instruments are playing the same note is beautiful music. That's how the church needs to function. Ezekiel 11, verse 19, God says, I'll give them one heart and I'll put a new spirit within them. Romans 12, 4 and 5 talks about us being many members, one body. We all don't have the same function. Just like you have an orchestra with all different kinds of, of instruments. Okay? But, in Romans chapter 12, verse 5, in the same way, we who are many are one body in Christ and individual members of one another. We need to be of one heart, one purpose, one spirit, one soul. We need to be in agreement as we relate to God. Acts chapter 2, verse 1, when they're in Pentecost, it said they all gathered in one accord. They continued daily in one accord. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, that was one spirit, one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, one spirit, one body. Ephesians chapter 4, 4, 5, and 6, says one body, one spirit, one hope. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. It takes practice to be unified. We need to have a united membership. Uniformity of belief and purpose, and harmony and practice. But also another practice that we need to be promoting is we need to have unselfish motives. Submitting to one another and also submitting to God's leadership. In Mark chapter um, 10, Jesus said this. He said, the Son of Man did not come to serve but to be served and gave his life a ransom for many. What about you? What about servanthood versus servility. Self-serving versus serving others. Well, servanthood serves with love. Servility serves without love, but selfishness. Servanthood says, I want to serve God. Servility says, I want to, I want to, I, I, um, I have to serve God, like it's an obligation. Servanthood is concerned about what God sees Servility is concerned about what others say. Servility is, is, is says it's not my job, but servanthood says whatever it takes. The results of servanthood are God glorifying. The results of servility are self-seeking. We have to have unselfish motives submitting one to another. You know, if we're not careful, property, an organization, can become an idol. Whose church is this? It's not yours, it's not mine. Acts chapter 20, verse 28, puts it like this. Paul has the elders, pastors, preachers from Miletus show up there in Ephesus to bid farewell to them. So this is probably the last time you're going to see me on this side of this world. He says, so take heed to yourselves, to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers or bishops, to shepherd or pastor the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. The church belongs to Christ. He's the one who bought it. He's the one who paid for it. Not me, not you, not anyone else, not on this earth. It belongs to him. And like I said, nothing can stamp it out. Government can't do They can do whatever they want to do, but they need to go back and look at church history and see what happened every time the Roman government tried to squash the church, it grew. The more they persecuted it, the more it grew. The church has always grown in persecution, but it's waned in prosperity. Acts chapter 28 and 17 we see three different terms for one office. He calls the elders from Miletus 
to come see him, refers to them as pastors and bishops. Elder, bishop, pastor, one office. And then there's deacons. Okay, I don't believe in this elder board stuff. The Bible says pastor and deacons. Philippians talks about that. Our Baptist faith and message says the officers of the New Testament church are pastor and deacon. Pastor is the lead elder. Pastor is the overseer. Pastor is the shepherd. Now I mentioned that we need to submit one to another, but we also need to submit to godly leadership. And part of the problem is, is most of our, several of our churches are not set up to allow a pastor to lead like he needs to. But this church did in Jerusalem, and the result was this. The Bible says when everyone submitted one to another, and the Bible says when they got rid of all their stuff and had it in common, and the Bible said when they were one, the apostles preached the resurrection, the gospel of Jesus Christ with power. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says that when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will have power to witness. I mentioned before I like the idea of looking at a problem and looking for solutions instead of blaming everybody. Well, it's this one's fault, it's that one's fault, it's this group's fault, it's that group's fault, it's the denomination's fault, it's Joe Biden's fault. Instead of finding a solution. What is the solution? I'll tell you what the solution is. The solution is we need to witness in power. We need the, the power of the Holy Spirit, old-fashioned power of the Holy Spirit. And we are not going to have it if we're disunified. That's right. We're not going to have it if every person wants their thing, this thing, that thing, instead of the one thing. And I'm going to talk about the one thing here in, in a few moments when we get ready to close. Now, I mentioned that some churches are not set up to allow a pastor to leave. Well, there's some pastors I call hirelings and I call hobby preachers. Um, I learned that from an old director of missions named Fred Lunsford out in Cherokee. He said, you got hobby preachers out there. You go, they like getting in the pulpit, but that's it. They, like, they don't want to do anything else. You don't need a hireling. You don't need a hobby preacher. You need someone called by God to preach his word, to preach his word and lead you to be the church that God wants you to be. Now, the pastor must motivate and mentor for people to follow. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16 talk about that God has gifted some prophets, some apostles, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, pastor slash teacher. He said, and the reason is, is the building up of the saints. Equip, empower, and encourage. So the solution is simple. The church is set up for the leadership to lead, and the leadership leads, and the, ch and the church follows. After that one thing. After that one thing. Now, what is that one thing? I'm going to talk about this tomorrow when I talk about value of vision. One well, of the primary purposes of a pastor is to cast a catchable vision. Cast a catchable vision. I'm going to talk more about that tomorrow. But thirdly, in practicing promoting oneness, we need to have an unequal message. What message do our churches send? I would like to hear about a church that I heard about back in the mid-90s that was known for the powerful moving of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't a Baptist church, it wasn't in North Carolina, it was in Florida, was in Pensacola. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what anybody tells you. I was there. It was real. I saw it. I'm like Festus Hagen says. I'm an eyeball witness to what went on there. And it was powerful. 
People got saved out of the, the debauch sin. Lives were changed like I've never seen before. I would like us as Southern Baptists to be known as the place where the Holy Spirit moves. The place where the Holy Spirit moves. A place where you can go and get saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, and fire baptized. Like we used to be. We talk about the good old days and bringing back this and bringing back that. Well, I'm not saying we need to go back to 1851, but I'll bet you in 1851 there was some fire going on in Falls Baptist Church. I'll bet you the Holy Spirit was moving. And apparently something happened over the past, what, 171 years to keep it moving. But if we want to keep it moving, it needs to be unified. There needs to be a unity of membership. There needs to be unselfish motives, and there needs to be an unequaled message. And that is Jesus Christ comes to save sinners. Amen. I don't know why we have to keep changing the name of stuff. Okay? The gospel's simple. Repent of your sins. Place your faith in Jesus. Surrender to Jesus as Lord and follow him for the rest of your life. Now what's hard about that? Instead of calling people sinners that need to repent and get saved, we talk about them being far from God. Well, what does far from God mean? How far? You can be sitting here on the front pew and be far from God. You don't need to be down in some alley with a needle in your arm I don't know why we, we, we keep changing stuff. I went to an evangelism conference for the state of, of the South Carolina, put on by the South Carolina Baptist State Convention in Columbia several years ago, and I won't mention the guy's name. No, I'm not going to mention it. Because then I'll go on a whole other sermon. I never heard the word repentance mentioned once the whole day. Not until an old preacher got up there in the morning for his session, after most everybody left, and he talked about repentance. There's no repentance. You know, there's no forgiveness. I mean, you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul says, you're upset. I made you sorry. You're mad. I'm glad I made you mad. I'm glad you're sorry. Because... Godly sorrow leads to repentance, and repentance leads to salvation. Amen. People just aren't sorry anymore. They're not broken anymore well, over sin. When was the last time we had people wailing and squalling about the things that they've done or haven't done? When was the last time we took sin seriously? Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, who was a pastor in, in, in Germany. Um, Nazis came to power and he came to America and he's sitting around and he told another preacher, he goes, it's not right that my countrymen are over there suffering under the Nazis and I'm sitting here safe, I need to go back. So he goes back and he calls Adolf Hitler and his whole bunch of cronies, so they're stupid. Of course, he got thrown in prison. And he was hung six weeks before the end of the war at Flossenburg concentration camp, which had been in Germany, it's over near Grafenbeer. <clears throat> but he said a lot of things. He had a lot of things to talk about, uh, uh, to say about discipleship and grace. And he mentioned costly grace and cheap grace. He said, cheap grace is this. It's not even grace at all. It's false or unbiblical perversion of God's word and translated as grace. He said, cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion and absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. That's a lot, of, we got a lot of that going on out here around our church. Oh, we don't want to upset anyone. Oh, we all just want to get along. Oh, we don't want to offend people. Jesus offended a lot of people. That's right. 
Okay? I'm not saying we purposely go out there and ram the gospel down their throat, but we need to get rid of this cheap grace that is no grace and talk about costly real grace. Bonhoeffer says biblical grace, and he likens it to that passage in Matthew 13, 44, 45, and 46, where the, the man finds his treasure in a field, and he goes and sells everything he has to buy that field. You find the gospel and what Jesus has done for you, forgiveness of sin, a whole new life, one with purpose here on this earth, and one that goes on forever after you die. Hope beyond the grave. The man sold everything he had to get it. He talks about the pearl of great price. A man finds his pearl, and he sells everything he has to get that priceless pearl. For the, for the sake of it, that field, treasure in the field, the man gladly went, gladly went and sold everything he had. The pearl of great price, he went and bought it from a merchant. He sold everything he had to get it. Costly grace is kingly rule of Christ, for whose sake a man will pluck out his eye, which causes him to stumble. It is the call of Jesus Christ at which the disciple leaves his nets and follows him. A powerful, changed life. 2 Corinthians 5.17 New creature. So the Jerusalem church practiced unity among the members. They practiced unselfish motives and they practiced an unequal message. One. One, 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 one. The word one is used 2,311 times in the Bible. Almost 1,600 in the New Testament and over, in the Old Testament over 700 in the New. One heart, Ezekiel 11. One spirit, 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians 4 and Philippians 1. One accord, Acts 2 and Acts 5. One body, Romans 12. One thing, Psalm 27. One voice, Ezekiel 37. One thing, one thing. Paul gave a simple, simple formula to the Philippian church. In chapter 2, he said this. He goes, if there's any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, he asked them, please fulfill my joy by being like-minded. Not agreeing with me. Paul's not saying agree with me, but be in agreement with one another. Be like-minded. Same mind. What is that same mind? The same mind focused on that one thing. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out, not for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Verse 5, he says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. I want to close with this verse, and then we're going to sing, and I'm going to ask you to respond. I already started the invitation with Matthew 5. If there's something you've got to say to someone, you need to say it tonight. Okay? It ends here tonight. If there's something that needs to be reconciled, it needs to be done tonight. If you need to come to this altar and get right with God, you need to come. Tonight. No more waiting. No more, as Carl Bates used to say, dilly dally. Tonight. One. I mentioned that one thing. Philippians chapter 3, this is a text I preach at every church I go to when I do it intentionally, or I start off with this. Because if they don't deal with the past, they're not going forward. I'm going to tell you that right now. They're just going to go, do this. And this is not this. This is this. And it gets faster and faster the more you go. And once you cross that point of no return, that's it. Paul said in verse 12, Philippians chapter 3, he goes, not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on. That means strains forward. That I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of for me. 
Behold, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forward to those things which are ahead. And that's a picture of a runner. You ever see those runners when they come across the fish and finish line in the Olympics? They got that tape out there and they lean forward and hit it. That's what Paul said. I'm leaning forward, pressing on. I'm not looking back. I'm forgetting all that nonsense back there. It's done behind me. And I'm reaching forward to that which is ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Are you willing to surrender all tonight? Let's stand together.